over the course of the next session, we're going to be tackling head on a topic that we've addressed in various ways over the course of the past two days, which is the debate that's currently happening over free trade and protectionism. Um, recent Economist article basically opened by saying, trade policy wonks are gluttons for punishment. In good times, their pet topic is dismissed as dull, and in bad, they find trade being faulted for everything. Um, I think we're basically finding ourselves in uh, facing the latter right now. Um, so as President Trump uh, imposes steel tariffs, um, there's kind of a question as to what the future of free trade is. Um, how we're going to proceed in the next session is to examine debates that have happened over this historically. Um, to give us this historical context, we have with us Douglas Irwin, the John French Professor of Economics at Dartmouth College. He is the author of many books, most recently Clashing Over Commerce, A History of U.S. Trade Policy, a copy of which you have in your bag. And he will be interviewed by the Wall Street Journal's Maria Anastasio Grady, whose column The Americas covers politics, economics, and business in Latin America and Canada. Please join me in welcoming them to the stage. Thirty-year plans and death counts. A little rough first thing Saturday morning. Um, I, uh, I brought a prop. I guess I just heard that all of you have a copy of this in your, in your bag. Um, I thought the way we have 45 minutes, uh, you know, if it were up, for, up to me, I would just sit here and talk to uh, Doug Irwin the whole time. But uh, we've agreed that about half the time will be for all of you to ask questions. And my sense is that a lot of contemporary issues will come up. So I thought maybe a good way to get started would be to talk about um, some of the historical stuff that's in the book. Um, I love economic history. And I found a number of things really fascinating. Um, if for no other reason, then it was deja vu all over again. I mean, so much of what you read about the history of US trade policy is happening again today. Um, so. I've been writing for more than two decades uh, at the Journal about the struggle to open markets around the world. And I confess that um, the book introduced me to some debates and slugfests in the history of US trade that I, I really was, frankly, unaware of. Um, of course, I knew about the clash between the North and the South. The North wanted protectionism. The South wanted more open markets. Um, and uh, Doug goes into quite a bit of uh, detail on that. It's really worth, worth reading. And I also knew that Alexander Hamilton um, launched the Coast Guard to basically protect um, against smuggling. But I never realized that more than one of our founding fathers were really against unilateral openness. And um, I think you mentioned uh, Madison in the book. And if you'll just bear with me, I'd like to just cite a couple of um, um, parts of the book where um, Doug talks about uh, Hamilton's resistance to, of all things, the ideas of Adam Smith. Um, he says, well, first of all, you know that Hamilton wrote um, uh, a very important paper called The Report on the Subject of Manufacturers. And in the book, um, Doug notes that Hamilton, um, uh, sorry, let me just find the, um, Hamilton made a broad ranging and powerful case for government protection of domestic manufacturing, providing not only theoretical justifications for such a policy, but specific proposals for government actions as well. And he also, um, uh, um, was against Adam Smith's idea that government support was unnecessary because industry, if left to itself, would naturally find its way to the most useful and profitable employment whence it is inferred that manufacturers without the aid of government will grow up as soon and as fast as the natural rate of things and the interests of the community may require. Yay, Adam Smith. But Hamilton didn't like that. And so he set about to, um, to, to impose more protection. He favored direct targeted subsidies as the best way to promote manufacturing. He was less enthusiastic, but not opposed to moderate tariffs. So sorry for reading to you from your own book. But <laughs> um, I did think that that was really interesting. And um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about um, 
how Hamilton influ influenced the early um, uh, trade policy of the U.S. and maybe how that ended up affecting the growth of the country. Sure. So uh, Alexander Hamilton is an absolutely fascinating figure. You should go see the Broadway play. You should read the Ron Chernow biography. He, I think he was the smartest of the founding fathers, an incredible intellectual mind. Um, his views on trade policy are, are rather interesting. So he did write the report on manufacturers in 1791. And he was pushing back against Adam Smith. And he did say uh, that we should be encouraging manufacturers. But that's an important word. He, never, he, didn't, he was not a protectionist. He wanted to encourage manufacturing. And he wanted the US to become more of a manufacturing power than we were in 1790, which is we had very little manufacturing whatsoever. And he thought we were sort of vulnerable and that we should be, uh, once again, encouraging, but not necessarily protecting. As a policymaker, as Secretary of the Treasury, he was absolutely critical in terms of uh, the Customs Service and uh, uh, paying down the debt and things of that sort. And uh, in terms of the tariff policies that he, he did, he wanted, he basically wanted a tariff for revenue, not so much for protection. So he wanted moderate rates, not really high rates. He was more interested in funding the debt and uh, becoming, making the U.S. credit worthy rather than trying to become sort of an isolationist or um, protectionist in that sense. And here's where the contrast with Madison is sort of interesting. Because if you read Madison's speeches on the floors of the House, um, he's, he's pro Adam Smith. He actually sort of quotes Adam Smith and uh, is very favorable. As president and as a policymaker, uh, he was Secretary of State in the Jefferson administration, then became president. He was sort of anti Adam Smith in the sense that uh, he wanted embargoes, um, trade sanctions, uh, limits on imports. And so uh, Hamilton and Madison, in some sense, flipped position intellectually. Madison was much more for Adam Smith, Hamilton uh, more, much more skeptical. But in terms of the practical policies of the day, uh, Hamilton was much more um, for open trade, for encouraging trade, and uh, Madison much more draconian and statist in some sense. But I wonder, you know, I immediately think about the, that they opened the door to protectionism, in, even if it was just for revenues. And that obviously started to empower certain special interests. Yes. And one of the big problems of opening trade is that, particularly if you don't have a unilateral tariff, is that these special interests, you know, we know from public choice theory, these special interests spend 24 seven, you know, fighting you. And they have a lot of money to do it because they have the protection, sugar being the best example. Right. So did those early founding fathers you know, um, openness to the idea of protection. Did that start something that we're still living with today? Well, so one of the themes of the Pig book- Pig iron, I'm thinking. Yep. <laughs> one of the themes of the book is that there are three R's of trade policy, revenue, restriction, and reciprocity. Those are the three purposes by which we've endowed Congress with the power to levy taxes on imports, to raise revenue, because taxes are, uh, tax, tariffs are taxes, um, to restrict imports, to protect domestic producers from foreign competition, and then to reach reciprocity agreements, uh, to bargain with other countries to, to lower tariffs. Now, uh, here's once again where the, the contrast between Hamilton and uh, Madison is sort of interesting, uh, because the tariffs that Hamilton wanted were fairly uniform for revenue purposes. Um, and, and he uh, was actually resisted a lot of pressure from import competing groups for higher revenue taxes because, uh, on imports because he wanted, them to, he wanted imports to come in. That was the tax base. You don't want to threaten the tax base. Um, when Madison comes in, and Jefferson in particular, uh, there's a, uh, Jefferson, uh, many people don't know this, but it's a fascinating episode in US trade policy history. Jefferson declared a one year embargo on foreign trade for the United States. I mean, think what the president, you know, there's a lot of upset about President Trump and tariffs on this and that. So how about just shutting down all trade for one year? Shutting down all the ports. Well, that's what they did. And that's what led to infant industries arising in the absence of imports, uh, new manufacturers. And then once you want to get rid of the embargo, that's, you've created the special interests. They're demanding the high tariffs. So I don't blame Hamilton so much in, in the 1790s and the early 1800s. But by 1807, when we have this embargo, and then we have the War of 1812, which cuts us off from more trade, and so we have more indigenous domestic manufacturers coming up, that's creating the domestic interest groups that then influence the tariff uh, politics in Congress and really lead to the protectionism and the special interests that demand it. Well. That provokes a lot of other questions. I'm going to stick with my questions okay. here, but wow, that's really interesting. Um, 
I noticed well, when if I, I could just, uh, just sure, follow no, up on that. A lot of people say, oh, the government should raise tariffs to create infant industries and then we'll be richer or something like that. That's the theory. In history, it's worked exactly the opposite. We, we get the infant industries through these tr accidents of history and then they demand the tariffs. So it's not as though there's conscious government policy saying we're going to pick these sectors. It's the sectors come up and then they demand of the government uh, protection. Okay, well now you're messing me up, Doug, because I have that as a question okay, later well, on in my... Okay, I don't no, want to well, get you off. Okay, <laughs> because that's a, that's a very interesting... Well, let me skip ahead to that now. Um, the reason I'm interested in that is because uh, uh, in Latin America, during basically after the Depression and until the late 1980s, that idea of infant industries really took hold and you know they uh, Raul Prebish from Cepal uh, went as far as to recommend this uh, import substitution industrialization where they had like 100% tariffs on things and the whole idea behind it was that they were going to grow their own domestic industries and um, it failed. I mean, the, the industries uh, d didn't have any competition, and as a result, the consumers had no choice, and the countries became poorer and poorer, and it wasn't until you know, the early 90s that, that um, Latin America started to open again. But you say in the book that, um, I think that you actually say something like that the, um, I have, I have the citation here. Because the United States industrialized under a regime of high tariffs, some observers have tried to draw lessons from America's experience in the late 19th century that would apply to developing countries today. Unfortunately, the vast differences between the US and developing countries today invalidate any such comparison. I'm not gonna keep reading, but that's, can you talk a little bit about that? Like why did it seem to work to industrialize the United States, but when these countries tried it, it was a failure? Right, so th that's exactly right uh, in my view. So uh, if you look at the late, the 19th century United States, we industrialized very rapidly, we grew very rapidly, we had very high tariffs. And so people say one caused the other. Well, as you all have learned, presumably in your studies, uh, correlation is not causation. And uh, there are a lot of other factors behind U.S. economic growth. Um, and, and so when you say, oh, the U.S. industrialized under higher tariffs, therefore you want to do that in Costa Rica or in Chile or in Argentina, it's not going to work for a number of reasons. First of all, in the late 19th century, the U.S. Was, uh, we had protective tariffs, but we were a very open economy. We were open to immigration from abroad. We were open to capital inflows from abroad. We were open to ideas from abroad. We were still very much uh, an open economy. We weren't a closed isolationist economy. In addition, we were a continental-sized market where we had free enterprise. So there's free entry. So we could borrow the best ideas from abroad. Entrepreneurs could um, uh, uh, have the scale in which to implement those policies. There was robust domestic competition. So even though we protected our manufacturers from foreign competition, competition at home is very robust. So that's the big difference with developing countries is you have very small markets. So as you know, Chile in the 1960s had 20 automobile assembly plants. The U.S. Uh, at the same time had uh, many fewer. Um, why? You just can't achieve economies of scale. You're going to be breeding very inefficient industries. Um, and the U.S., fortunately, from his historical experience, even though we had protective tariffs, we didn't breed a lot of inefficient industries because domestic competition was so robust. Yeah. So we were open and we had a lot of competition. And that's not true of a lot of the developing countries that have pursued import substitution strategies. Yeah, and I guess it's not just the size of the country because otherwise it would have worked for Brazil and it didn't. Right. Yeah. But um, Brazil had a lot of other impediments to competition in, yep. inside the country. Um, one of the things I noticed uh, with interest in the book was um, the remarkable repetition of the connection between recessions that start in the financial sector and are followed by manufacturers blaming foreign competition. Sound familiar? Um, and I noticed, uh, let's see, I guess it was in the early 19th century, you're, you know one recession, you say, although the recession originated in the nation's troubled financial sector, manufacturers blamed foreign competition for the weak economy. I mean, you know, I had to go back and check and make sure that wasn't 2009. Um, and then again, I think later on in, the, in, in around the 
30s or, or so. As a result, political pressures for trade protection grew strong. Oh, sorry. Um, the Compromise of 1833 was tested after the financial panic of 1837, and especially during the crisis of 1839, which led to four years of severe deflation and economic depression. Previous cases, the downturn had its origin in the financial system, but was manufacturing got blamed and foreign competition got blamed. Does that, can you, I mean, that keeps happening keeps all the happening. way through our history, right? Absolutely, yep. And, and here's where the correlation is not causation, sort of, uh, you have to sort of think things through. So uh, we've had this multiple times throughout U.S. history. The U.S. economy is doing well. The government's bringing a lot of tax revenue, so there's a surplus. We actually ran surpluses sometimes in the late 19th century and in uh, into the 20th century. We don't seem to do that anymore. Uh, but whenever there's a big surplus, the idea is, well, we can, now we can afford to cut taxes. The mo most important tax at this time was a tax on imports. So Congress pa passes a tax to reduce import tariffs, which manufacturers don't like, but it's hard to justify all the high taxes when the surpluses are growing. Now, inevitably, there's going to be a downturn of some sort, and we don't know what the triggers are for every single one. There will be a downturn. All of a sudden, the government will have a fiscal deficit. Uh, import competition will be more robust. Manufacturers are laying off workers. It's very hard times. And they'll clamor for import protection as a way of, of uh, helping them uh, get over that circumstance. Congress will respond to that pressure, pass a higher tariff law, and the economy naturally, not for the reason of that law, but for other reasons, would naturally start to recover and grow well. So what was the correlation that people would pick up from that? Gee, we cut tariffs and moved towards freer trade, and we had this recession. And we imposed the higher tariffs, and we recovered. Ergo, the tariffs driving this. In fact, the tariffs are just responding to the politics of the, the cycle, which is being driven by financial factors, monetary factors, and all sorts of other things. But that's, just, yeah. just to skip ahead to something that is contemporary, um, this time around, while the president seems pretty committed to the idea of more protection, um, Congress has not jumped on that bandwagon. Do you think that's because, well, one of the reasons I thought that things are changing is because there's so many manufacturers that require imports. So they, they've themselves become a special interest group. Do you think that explains why, um, despite the harsh recession, there has been sort of some put, a lot, quite a bit of pushback against the president's idea of, of uh, closing up the country again? Absolutely, so a lot of manufacturers are dependent on imported components, and they see if, the, if we impose tax, say, on steel, so domestic steel prices rise, that's gonna hurt the downstream competitive uh, industries that depend on cheap steel. So automakers, John Deere, Caterpillar, if their costs rise, how can Caterpillar compete against Komatsu in a global market if uh, we pose a 20% tax on the inputs used by uh, John Deere or Caterpillar? So it's handicapping domestic firms, so they're gonna fight back because they're in a competitive struggle as well. Uh, we also see um, uh, exporters complaining. So it's not just uh, exporters of manufactured goods, but it's the farmers in the Midwest yeah. who are going to be, first of all, hit if there's retaliation, uh, but also their costs are going to go up. You know, if they have to pay more expensive, more for farm equipment because steel prices go up, um, they're going to get squeezed that way. Uh, so there, it's... Does that make you optimistic about the politics of this? Absolutely, this because uh, the, in the past, why we've been able to enact protective tariffs is because Congress didn't have some sort of intellectual idea about what the right tariff policy would be. They're, respect, they're responding to the pressures that are put on them. If they only hear from industries that want import protection, guess what they're going to do? They're going to respond to that and provide import protection. But now in Washington, uh, politicians hear from exporters. They hear from groups that depend on imported components. And all of a sudden, what that does is just muddies the water, and it becomes much harder for any administration or any Congress to say protectionism will work for America. And you've, even though the Trump administration, and we'll, we'll talk about that, I'm sure, going forward, and I'm sure the questions will get to that, um, has what I think are very bad instincts. They've been somewhat slow in rolling out some of their things because, precisely because there's a debate within the administration, there's a debate among uh, other constituent groups who oppose what they want to do. Yeah, and even a debate among Republicans. Absolutely. The, Republican, the red states, I think, are. Um, one of, uh, a section of your book that caught my attention was when you talked about the shift in U.S. trade policy from restriction to reciprocity. Um, because, uh, you know, obviously Britain was very open in the 19th century. We mm -hmm. think of it as being a pretty open economy. But the rest of the world 
hasn't been off and on in a lot. And you say, the early post-war period brought about the most momentous shift in US trade policy since the nation's founding. I mean, that's a big statement. Um, the objective of US trade policy shifted from restriction to reciprocity, from using protective tariffs to shield domestic industries from foreign competition to using trade agreements. Can, can you talk a little bit about sure. that? Sure. And here is actually, it uh, dovetails with what you know about Latin America and the reforms uh, in the 70s and 80s. Usually there was an economic crisis or you got a new team that came in and said we have to push the uh, economy in a different direction. So the crisis for the United States was the Great Depression. And then you get into the Smoot-Hawley tariff and things of that sort of the trade wars of the 1930s. One of the impacts of the trade wars of the 1930s was uh, a lot of protection against the United States and other markets. So uh, countries retaliated against the United States, but they also formed trade blocks. There was imperial preferences that kept Canada, Britain, Australia, and other markets sort of discriminated against the US. And so when the Roosevelt administration, here's another sort of historical flip, it used to be the Democrats were the free trade party, and the Republicans historically have been the party of protection. When the Democrats came in in the election of 1932 with uh, Roosevelt, uh, usually what the Democrats would do is just have a unilateral tariff reduction. So if the Republicans raised the tariff, the Democrats would come in and cut it. But they realized in the midst of the Depression, first of all, it's very difficult to justify politically reducing the tariff when the unemployment rate is 20, 25 percent. But second of all, it wouldn't solve the problem that the U.S. faced in the 1930s, which is that other countries had erected high tariff barriers against the United States and were discriminating against, discriminating against U.S. commerce. And so what they did is they said, we need a new system of trade policy where we empower the executive branch to negotiate with other countries. We'll reduce our tariffs if you reduce yours. And you're absolutely right. We didn't have to worry about that in the 19th century because Britain, one of our biggest markets, was open. They had free trade. So we didn't have to worry about what other countries were doing. But in the Depression, we did. And that leads yeah. to the shift after World War II where we want trade agreements with other countries to reduce trade barriers overall. OK, well, we have to get to the 800-pound gorilla known as China. Um, I have been uh, interested in some libertarian arguments I've heard uh, pushing it back against the, uh, the sort of conventional wisdom that the problem with China is they steal intellectual property. And um, uh, John Tammany, at, uh, who writes for Real Clear Markets, I think, has written about this, and he's the one who brought my attention to it. Um, that, you know, intellectual property um, has historically moved around uh, the, uh, the globe. And it really caught my attention in your book, I'm going to find this uh, citation because it's just marvelous. I, um, the New England uh, cotton textile industry was the most striking new industry to have arisen during the period of disruptive trade. From the tariff of 1816 to the present day, the textile and apparent industry has been at the center of trade policy. The first cotton mill in the United States was set up in Rhode Island in 1790 using art Arkwright technology. This spinning technology was brought to the country by Samuel Slater, a superintendent of an early Lancaster, Lancashire mill. Slater memorized the blueprints of the equipment used before he sailed to America because Britain banned the export of textile machinery and officials would have searched his possession for descriptions of the technology as he left the country. The technology gradually spread through Massachusetts and Rhode Island, and by 1807, the United States had about 15 cotton mills working 8,000 spindles. Um, basically, we stole the technology to get going. <laughs> so what about that argument that, you know, I mean, one of the things that companies do is they sign joint ventures and they say to the Chinese, their Chinese partner, okay, we're going to give you this technology. I'm guessing they don't give them the best stuff. You know, they give them like one generation back maybe. And they've decided, okay, it's worth trading this much technology for this much access to your market and everything. Why isn't that okay? Or is it okay? So there's a big difference between what the US did in the 19th century and what China is doing today. And the big difference is this. We are certainly open to technology. People could bring it in if they wanted to. China has a state-sponsored mercantilist policy to demand and extract it. So it's a difference between what the state is doing and what private individuals and uh, Yes, but doing. wait a minute. Britain said you cannot take this technology out. They would have searched his, his possessions. So we're saying 
you know, the, 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 he smuggled it out and gave it to China. Right. But also, we, in terms of exporting our technology, don't have a policy saying you can't export our technology. It's the Chinese state that's demanding it as, in terms of whether you can come okay. to the market or not. The U.S. never demanded, mm -hmm. never told Samuel Slater to do that, never demanded that any foreign investment have some certain requirements. And if those violate WTO agreements, where we want the sort of the fair play, we don't want governments putting their fingers on the uh, scales of international competition, I think uh, there are some potential problems there. So you don't agree with me? Do you agree with me that it may be overstated? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so the, the administration just released a uh, two or three hundred page report on uh, China's unfair trade practices. And it's uh, weak in parts because it's very anecdotal and uh, um, uh, really doesn't pin things down. But that's also part of the problem with dealing with China is that they don't necessarily write things down. It's, uh, you know, it's, there's sort of an implicit demand that uh, you have to um, uh, accommodate uh, uh, you know, Chinese officials and, and Chinese government regulations which are not explicitly written down. So, I mean, I was in China a couple of years ago, and I, I toured a Dannon uh, yogurt factory. And they said when Dannon came in, um, you know, they built this beautiful stainless steel uh, containers to uh, make all this yogurt. Within six months, right across the street, a plant, identical technology, three times the capacity came up uh, from a Chinese uh, manufacturer. Now, Dannon still has the brand, and they still can make money in China. Um, but uh, it was not exactly sort of free enterprise at work, I think, in, mm -hmm. in uh, bringing up, up that, uh, uh, that shift. Okay. I'm going to keep fighting that one, but um, <laughs> not now. Um, <clears throat> I want to ask you about uh, the, way you th the, the way you think about um, um, technology in the, in the, in the development and the, in keeping markets open and so forth. And let me just see if I have a citation here. Okay, so we've spent about the last 30 years or so arguing about how we should protect U.S. manufacturing. But you note that as early as 1977, um, and I will give you the citation, a long -term, there was a long-term trend change due to technology. And you say, um, while some manufacturing industries were expanding employment, others were experiencing large permanent de uh, declines in employment. Between 1977 and 87, the number of production workers in the primary metals industry, which is blast furnaces, basic steel, fell by 390,000. Okay, that's 77 to 87. And employment in textiles and apparel fell nearly 600,000. And you mentioned that the term deindustrialization began to take hold and so forth. And here we are so many years later, mm -hmm. and you know, there is this shift toward services. There's manufacturing in the US is actually robust, even mm -hmm. though the the headlines don't say that, but um, manufacturing is doing very well. But there is a sort of a long-term trend that it has technology overtaking a lot of employment and so forth. And, and so I'm just curious about, um, is, that, is that conversation getting clearer for us? Because back in 77 or 87, people were, oh, this is terrible. But now are we starting to understand that trade is only part of that and that technology is, 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 the, bigger picture, is the bigger story? Um, I, certainly in the circles I travel, um, people are aware of that. I'm not sure how well the general public is aware of it or politicians. So you know, the example there is our steel output is not falling. Our steel output is still very high. The number of workers in the steel industry has fallen quite dramatically because of technology. So in 1980, it took 10 worker hours to produce a ton of steel. Now it takes two worker hours to produce a ton of steel. So we're producing a lot of steel. We just need many fewer workers uh, to accomplish that. And that's not just true in steel. It's uh, true in a whole host of industries. Now, there's some industries like uh, apparel that has really moved offshore. But we're still a major manufacturing power, a major manufacturing exporter. The manufacturing sector has just shifted in terms of what we're producing, not in terms of uh, overall reduction or, or total deindustrialization. In that this sense. is a little bit of a softball coming in. But I, <laughs> OK. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Time flies. OK. Um, can I just ask you, would you agree that um, open trade is very important to uh, Continuing that our competitiveness in 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 um, with respect to technology. 
Absolutely, because uh, it's competition. It gives us access to the best uh, uh, machinery out there. You know, it's ironic that Roger Milliken, I was just down, down South Carolina, oh. and uh, it's uh, Roger Milliken Field. It, it's uh, Greensboro, uh, Spartansburg Airport. He was a big textile magnet in the South, very anti-trade, wanted to keep out uh, foreign textiles. He always insisted, however, on buying the very best textile manufacturing equipment, which you could only get in Germany and Switzerland. So he wanted free trade on his inputs, but he wanted protection on his outputs. And I think what's happened is we have global supply chains today that is very different from the 1970s and 80s. We have integrated uh, process manufacturing that cross borders. That's in true with the auto industry and NAFTA and what have you. And so putting up tariff walls now is very different than it was in the past. Now it's like building a wall within the middle of a factory, interrupting that supply chain, interrupting that, uh, 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 that production process. Back in the 19th century, we were mainly importing final goods. In that case, it was one producer against another. Um, so you can see why they want protection. That's why manufacturing as a whole really doesn't want protection because they've integrated themselves yeah. with the world. Yeah. And it yeah. makes things efficient and the benefits are for consumers. Okay, I'm told I have to go to questions, which means that I just have to make a blanket statement that trade deficits do not matter. I, I, I was gonna get you to explain that, but just remember that and not. <laughs> Maybe it'll, maybe it'll come up in the questions, but time to turn it over to our, our audience. Hi, uh, Quinn Connolly from Vanderbilt University. Uh, how would you respond to so-called trade pragmatists like Danny Roderick who argue that democracy, national sovereignty, and uh, free trade are incompatible? Um, I don't think they are incompatible. I think that um, I think the U.S. has been an example of that, where uh, we have a, uh, a domestic policy of relative openness. We've uh, signed uh, WTO agreements. I don't think it's sacrificed our sovereignty or our democracy in any way. Um, when you look at many developing countries, uh, uh, they've wanted to sign trade agreements with the United States uh, because it helps them lock in domestic reforms. Um, they've moved towards democracy of the, as they've liberalized and opened up. They've made them more prosperous societies. Um, and so uh, I just, and once again, when you sign a trade agreement, yes, you are giving up some of your sovereignty, but you're doing it for a purpose, and you want to tie your hands in some sense so that uh, you don't get, so you move the special interest politics into a different direction. Yes. Hey, I'm Diem from Ross. Uh, I have two questions. Quite first question is, uh, what does uh, Trump's administration really wants in terms of trade war with China? And second question is, if intellectual, property is, uh, is the issue. Uh, I think intellectual property is always an issue in terms of regional. Uh, so those, those foreign company in, happens in, in China, people can move around. And what does Trump or, or, or US company really wants in order to, uh, to secure the property? Uh, yeah, to, to question. So what, how, to, how to solve that question? Okay. Because China, I think they already imposed a law to increase the uh, to protect uh, IP. So what does the Trump administration want? They want to win. <laughs> okay? That's it. That's the bottom line. The question, of course, what's winning? Isn't free trade winning when both sides are sort of open to exchange? Um, so uh, the problem here, and you, you use that word, trade deficit, the problem is, well, how do you judge whether you're winning or not? His metric, the president's metric, is whether you have a trade surplus or not. So if there's a trade imbalance, then uh, and if we trade deficit, we're losing. And of course, that's completely the wrong metric uh, to use. That said, and here's where we get to the China debate, um, there are some issues with China. So US businesses are pulling back from China precisely because of intellectual property. China is moving in a mercantilist direction. They have the Made in China uh, 2025 initiative, which identifies you know, some five or half a dozen sectors where they want dominance and they're gonna exclude foreign participation. Now, the question is, what do, should we do anything about that? One thing we should do is if they violate WTO agreements that they have signed, we should be taking WTO cases and we should be bringing our allies in Europe and Asia together with us to pressure uh, China to not move in a closed mercantilist direction. Um, and then you can get into debate about whether you need uh, unilateral actions uh, on the part of the US. But certainly I don't think anyone would say that if China's vi explicitly violating agreements that they've signed that we shouldn't enforce those. What's the point of the WTO if we just have unilateral free trade and we don't uh, care about the enforcement of trade agreements? Um, so I think, and this is something that transcends, I think, the Trump administration. Even in the late Obama administration, there's a lot of trade friction. There's even some national security concerns where uh, we're blocking for inward investment from Chinese firms, and we're worried about the supply chain. So what happens if you're flying in an F-15, and there's a backdoor to the chip that's uh, 
running your fuel system or your weapon system, and the Chinese hackers uh, you know, redirect the, the weapons. I'm not saying that's a real fear, but there is that fear out there. And so I think there's a lot of national security, geopolitical, uh, strategic uh, dimensions to the U.S.-China relationship, and trade is just one part of it. Yes. Hi, my name is Rafa. I'm here from Carnegie Mellon University. No tuck? <laughs> Where's, where are all the tuckies from Dartmouth? Okay, how about Chicago Booth? Okay, I taught there in the fall. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, There's one no there. problem. Okay. Um, so my question is around growth in manufacturing. Um, historically, we see that growth in manufacturing sort of moves with a lead to growth in GDP, and there's a much higher intensity. We have now been in a period of nine years of expansion, but we don't see the similar growth in manufacturing, or any at all, really. So is, are we in uncharted territory now? Uh, does this mean, and I use this word loosely, in a more stable period of economic growth, so to speak? Uh, what are your views on this? Well, it's certainly true that we have become and are continuing to move to become a service economy. So the share of employment in, uh, so once again, this, this big book, which you can uh, lug around with you, luckily they give you a tote bag so you uh, don't <laughs> drop it on your toe or something like that. But you know, when this book began, 90% of the uh, US labor force was in agriculture. And now we have de-agriculturalized the United States. Well, have we? We have 1% of the labor force in agriculture, but still, we're producing much more than we did in the 19th century, and that's productivity, producing more with fewer workers. Uh, we've had sort of the deindustrialization of the workforce in the sense that we used to have, at its peak, it was never the majority of the labor force. But after World War II, we had about 30, 35% of the labor force in manufacturing. Now it's down to less than 10%. So manufacturing, is, in terms of employment, is much less, but we're still a major manufacturing producer, and is, we're just moved towards higher value-add goods. That means the bulk of the labor force and the bulk of economic activity, in some sense, is in the service sector. And here, international trade is just as important, because we actually do trade a lot in services. We have, actually have a trade surplus in services. Uh, that's where our comparative advantage is. Um, and so uh, trade in services is just as important as trade in manufacturing. Um, it is, however, harder in some sense to reach trade agreements to open up markets for trade and services because each service sector is a little bit different than the other, and the regulations are not tariff barriers, but um, uh, domestic content provision and things of that sort. Um, so I think trade will, you know, even to the extent that uh, manufacturing and, and agriculture are less important in the aggregate, uh, there's still big sectors of the U.S. economy. They're still uh, widely engaged in trade, but uh, clearly the thrust has moved into the service sector, which typically is less volatile. Uh, over the course of a business cycle or what have you, uh, both in terms of output and employment. Um, so I'm not sure that, whether that answers your question, but that's how I'd think about it in a long 200-year span. Yes. Aaron Tao from Austin, Texas. I went to McCombs. Um, my question for you is, as you conducted the research for your book, what surprised you the most, and what's one general piece of knowledge you wish the, um, the public and policymakers would understand as we continue to debate these trade and trade issues? Well, in terms of public understanding, I have another book called Free Trade Under Fire, which is much shorter and much less dense and uh, sort of a gener general introduction to trade issues. So that, that would be the one that uh, I would sort of push upon the public. And if even a book is too much, I have a couple of articles in Foreign Affairs, which are shorter essays, which I think bring out the sort of the key points of trade. In terms of what surprised me during, in, in terms of my research, um, once again, the founding period is absolutely fascinating for the early debates. And you see these early debates being repeated time and time again. And I guess what surprised me is, um, and I didn't quite make this connection, uh, at least in terms of when I went into the book, the reason we have the Constitution of the United States is largely because of trade. Because the Articles of Confederation did not endow the uh, National Congress with powers uh, to raise taxes or to uh, regulate trade. And so uh, there weren't trade wars between the 13 states, uh, but there were a lot of trade difficulties. And when you, I have quotes from Madison and others saying the major motivation for the uh, uh, Constitutional Convention was to uh, get some control over U.S. trade policy um, and have, it, uh, have us uh, as a, a nation uh, be able to bargain with Britain. Uh, and here's sort of a, a Brexit lesson. Uh, the not founding fathers were a little bit naive, too. They thought, we, we can declare our political independence, but Britain will still treat our goods as part of the British Empire. Um, and uh, what happened is, is Britain said, okay, you want your political independence, you get your economic independence, too, and we're going to have to start charging surcharges on your goods and treating them like uh, you're not part of the British Empire. 
and we were shocked and horrified by that. The U.S. economy in the 1780s did very poorly, and that was another impetus for um, uh, the Constitutional Convention is, you know, uh, so we could bargain with Britain and other countries over trade. So that's the reciprocity aspect, which has always been a part of U.S. trade policy debates. Well, Doug, I, I have to say you made this so easy. I mean, <laughs> can you talk? Um, Thank you very much for wonderful questions. Very insightful. I'm glad I didn't have to answer them. And uh, with that, we'll close our session. Please join me in thanking Professor Arnold.